The uh, title of my sermon this morning, Perplexity But Not Despair. Um, you ever been perplexed? Yeah, I have too. And I have to say that sometimes I've been in despair too. But the word perplexed signifies embarrassment, difficulty, trouble, or anxiety. And despair is to give up hope and all expectation, to resign oneself to a state of hopelessness. So the title meaning we can get perplexed about a lot of things, but we're not to give up hope. We are not to be in despair. The twofold expression of Paul's, by Paul, embodies a true revelation of the experience common to all men and God's, even God's children. If you stop and think about something, in Matthew 4, John the Baptist had been preaching. And he had been reproving sin in his, in his sermons. And because of some of the things that he said, he was arrested and put in prison and, and put in stocks, you might say. And he was a little bit perplexed about that. He was doing God's work. And one night... When he was in despair, and it was heavy on his mind of this dedicated preacher, that he seemed confused about whether Jesus was the Messiah or not. And he talks about it in Matthew eleven three. He says, Art thou he that should come, or should we look for another? There have been some times in my life where I have been a little bit in that same kind of position. Where I was depressed and struggling with my life. And I didn't know Jesus. But he knew me. And I think he gave John that same kind of feeling that though he was in doubt and though he was wondering, there was a certain calmness and a peacefulness to that man. He knew that one was coming that would be greater than he. But he wasn't quite sure if Jesus was the answer. But I believe before he died, he was made aware of it. And we know what happened because of Herodias and her dealing with, with his chastisement of her being married to the king's brother. She should not be living the life that she was living. He, she didn't like that. And... So therefore, it worked out where John lost his life because of that. Because he told the truth. And there's another place in the Bible that I want us to look at this morning. It's in Esther 3, 1 through 15. The Jews in the days of Queen Esther were in a state of perplexity. The death sentence was hanging over their head. And if you remember the story, Haman, one of the uh, people in, in, uh, in the country who had 
worked his way up into a higher position through King Azarias, had convinced the king that there were some people in his country that weren't keeping his laws and that they should do something about it. And the king, being a little bit not informed as to what's going on, agreed with him, gave him his signet ring and let him write this edict that uh, all the Jews in the land should be killed. But something came to my mind as I was reading that. Because it says that Haman was an Agite. And I, and, I, and I started thinking about that a minute. Where did that name come from? And then I remembered. Back in 1 Samuel 15, God had told Samuel to tell Saul to go and take care of these people. It wasn't a good thing he told him. He told him to annihilate them. Take all of their animals and destroy everything about them. Women, children, old men, young men, everything about them. They were a country, they were a people that had defiled the Lord. And God was saying, enough's enough. And he gave Samuel, or Saul, the, the charge to take care of that. And so Saul goes down and he attacks these people and he, for the most part, did what he thought he was doing was right. He killed a bunch of people, but evidently he didn't kill them all. And he did bring the king back with him and all the animals that God had told him to totally destroy. Now you say, how does that fit in with Esther? Haman was a descendant of the people that Saul was supposed to annihilate. He was an Agite. So the trouble that came on God's people again, the Jews, was der derived from one of the ancestors of this country that, or people that was supposed to be removed from the face of the earth. So when we, today, in our life, knowing God's Word, knowing what He tells us to do, when we don't fulfill that, we open the door for repercussions sometime in the future, maybe. We don't know. When we don't obey what the good Lord tells us we ought to be doing, we should be ready to face whatever is left because his word is true but nonetheless the Jews were perplexed this death was hanging over their heads but God's remnant people will have to live through a period of perplexity unknown as before we find that in Daniel 12 verse 1 and 2 we're going to be affected by things that are going to take place in the future that we know not of. The whole world will in the last days enter into a state of perplexity. And that's found in Luke 21, 25, if you want to look that up. But it says something in Luke 21, 25. I want to read it to you because it got my attention. Luke chapter 21, verse 25, And there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on the earth distress of nations. Has all that been taking place in before our very eyes? The sun is, is supposedly throwing off these flares that are hotter than anything they've ever had before. We're seeing, we're seeing the earth reeling back and forth. Matter of fact, tonight we're going to watch a meteor shower that's going to take place right here. There'll be a distress of nations. Will we see that? We've been seeing that for a long time. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. I don't know how many of you noticed, but about a couple of weeks ago I was looking on my phone 
at the kind of, I Google, and then I look at the news that's flashing up there, and they were telling me that the waves that are coming ashore now are getting bigger than they've ever been before. And that the sea, the waves in the sea are roaring and, and much heavier and much harder than what they've ever experienced. And when I, I looked at that and I read it and it was okay, it didn't mean a big thing. And then as I began to look at my Bible in preparation of this sermon and I said, the sea and the waves are roaring and I remembered I had just read it in the news. Do you think we're living in the time when this world is beginning to show that it's coming apart at the seams. That the good Lord is coming. Nobody knows when. But he tells us that when a woman is about ready to have a child, there are signs, right? You know that that time is near. When we see this world doing what it's doing and we're seeing things happening, we know the time is here. The time is very close. But are we perplexed? Yes, we are. Events in the last days will bring on the night of Jacob's trouble. For God's commandment keeping people. That'll be the time when the people of God will cry day and night without an intercessor. We have to lean totally on Christ. We may not hear him talking back to us, but we have to lean on him. And we'll be perplexed. It says there will truly be a state of perplexity in Luke 18, 7 and 8. Let's read that. Luke 18, 7 and 8. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry day and night for him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? That struck me pretty heavy. Will he really find a faithful people here on this earth when he comes? There will be perplexity, but not in despair. Job was in a state of great perplexity, but never in despair. What did he say? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I will maintain my own ways before him. Job 13, 15. And then Jeremiah was in a state of perplexity, but never in despair. There were times when he wished he was dead. But he continued trusting in the God of the universe. Mordecai was perplexed at the time when the death sentence was hanging over the Jews. But he was never in despair. Read with me in Esther 4. Verses 13 and 14. And Mordecai, I told them. Well, let me go back a little bit. The decree had been written. And Haman was upset at Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. And verse 11, it says, And all the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called, he has, he has but one law to put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out his golden scepter. Now what had happened is Mordecai had asked his, wasn't really his daughter, but it was his niece, to go and talk to the king about this. And she was reminding him, they were reminding him that she can't go in there. She hadn't been in there to see him in over a month. 
And to walk into his presence without being invited was certain death. That's what it, we just read. And this is Mordecai's answer. So Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For you, if you remain in completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Now Mordecai was in despair. He believed in the God of heaven was going to take care of his people. And he says, if you don't go in there, somebody else will come up and save the Jews. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And this part I really like. And it's a message to us today. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days and nights. My maids and I will do likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. That's calling you and I to come together in prayer and fasting and reach out to God. When, when perplexity comes upon us, we need to come together as a body and pray for God's deliverance. That's why these are in the Bible. For, that's why these words are here to inspire us today. That though we're perplexed, we are not in despair. Nehemiah was harassed by the enemy day and night. He was greatly perplexed about the work of God, but he never despaired. Do you remember what happened to Nehemiah? Sanblat and his buddies were trying to stop him from building the wall. And Nehemiah was, was encouraging the people to carry their sword with them, and the watchmen were watching, and, but, but it was perplexing to him. They couldn't get the job done the way they wanted to do it because they were being harassed by the enemy. Well, aren't we harassed every day? Doesn't he after, isn't he after you the way you think and the way you talk? And the things you do, you're wondering, why did I do that? Or why did I say that? Just, we're in the same boat. Why do we expect this? Why do we look at this on the television or on the computer or whatever? We're being harassed day and night by the enemy. Why? Why? We're like the Jews were. As we continue this day, and as we go and look some more in the Bible, you're going to find the answer. There is no reason for God's people to despair at any time. God allows perplexity to, to come to his people. Not to discourage us, but for our good. And that's a hard thing for me to swallow. <laughs> When something goes bad, I have a hard time thinking it was my good for that to happen. But that's what God says, and God said it, and I believe it. And that settles it for me. That's what Paul meant when he taught in Romans 8, 26. And it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So even though we're perplexed and we're close to despair, God is there for us through the power of his spirit. He'll intercede on our behalf if we just come to him in prayer. The Lord uses trials to correct us 
and not to destroy us. Everything connected with our salvation remains the same. Christ is the same. God's word is the same. The love of God is the same. The things that befall us will in the end produce the most solitary effects in our lives. Look at the furnace of affliction in Isaiah. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen, are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. What you see around you is temporary. But the things in which you cannot see are eternal. So God is looking for a people that are consistent. Not people that are like the waves rolling back and forth. Therefore, my beloved brother, brothers, be ye steadfast, unmovable. To be steadfast and unmovable, one must be well-rooted and grounded in the truth. To the doctrine of Christ. Not to be carried away by every wind of doctrine. And we're going to see that. We're told that wolves will come into the church that look like sheep. We have to be cautious. We have to pray. We have to stay in contact with the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us. It is good for the heart to be established in the love of truth. We must build solidly on the Holy Scripture, on the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, on Christ, the rock of ages, upon the present truth, the prophetic messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, is the true basis for the great Second Advent movement. And it'll be impossible for one to remain steadfast in this movement unless he knows the truth from experience. So how do you know the truth from experience? You have to live it. You have to live it. We're to be unmovable. This requires a sure foundation. And the implication is that to be unmovable, we must live the truth we profess to believe. Now that throws a big weight right back at us, doesn't it? And the implication is that to be unmovable, we must live the truth we profess to believe. Only the doer of the word of God will be saved. So we need to ask him. What does he want me to do? What does he want you to do? Paul's timely admission finds a special application in the experience of God's remnant church. In Revelation 12, 17, there's a demonstration of what this church in the Bible is depicted for the Seventh-day Adventist church. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Is that what you believe in your heart? That's, the, that, that's what this church stands for. 
that has carried this church through from the very beginning. They are a small remnant or that which remains before Christ comes. They keep the laws. They have the testimony of Jesus in Revelation 19.10. It is against this group that Satan will declare war. Now maybe he's already done it. Maybe you're having a war in your own heart right now about something that's troubling you. Maybe you're in despair over something that's bothering you because Satan has caused you to fret and to worry. As we were driving down here today, my wife was telling me that she's agreeing that she's getting a little older. Well, I'm not very far behind her, so we're both getting a little older. But she says, you know what? I have total peace of mind. I don't worry whether I live today or tomorrow. Doesn't make any difference. I'll be happy as long as I'm here, and when I'm not ha- when I'm not here, I won't be happy. I won't be doing anything. That's a pretty good way to think of things. How can you be happy? You gotta love the Lord. You gotta be. You gotta be ready to go whenever He calls you, and whenever that is. None of us want to die. I don't mean that. But you know, when I had my heart attack a few months ago, well, it's been a year ago now, and they're taking me down to Modesto in the ambulance, and that guy was flying, and the sirens were blasting, and I'm laying there on my back watching the things go behind me, and they're watching my heart to see what it was doing. I wasn't afraid to die. I was not afraid at all. It was like, okay, this is cool. Good ride, Lord. Thanks. <laughs> I haven't driven this fast since I was on a racetrack. <laughs> That's the confidence we got to have. You know, we, we got to be so at peace with ourselves. Not that I'm perfect, not that I don't sin, but I got a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I talk to Him 24 7. Something happened the other day that got my attention. I heard a sermon. I can't remember now where it was from. But this, oh no, I was reading a book. That's where I got it from. And this fellow said that, that he, uh, this pastor gets up in the morning and he, t- he gets his pencil and paper, first thing he does. And he asks God, where are you going today? And he starts writing down whatever God tells him. Because I want to follow you. I don't want to do my agenda today. I don't have an agenda. What is yours? I want to follow you wherever you're going. And God tells him. He gives him things that he needs to do. He writes them down and he follows him. What does God's word say? Follow me. He told Peter, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You follow him, he's going to give you something to do. I don't know what it'll be, but it'll be something you got, but you got to trust in him. You got to have that confidence that no matter what happens, you're following in God's footsteps. You're following his direction in your life. Many of God's people will actually go through. And experience the time of Jacob's trouble. And to be left alone to lean upon the God of Israel. Many will be deprived of their rights as citizens. Well, we're already seeing that all over the world and other countries. They'll have their Bibles taken away from them. They'll be declared person persona non grata. They'll be hated by all men. It is then that we need to be rooted and grounded in the truth. I heard a children's story that I'm not going to be able to hear the end of it last week up in Waterford. They were telling of a pastor in Russia, just some years ago, 
that was having Bible studies in his home. And, and the police came and told him, you can't do this. You got to stop it. You guys can't do this. Well, they didn't stop. And the police came two or three more times, and finally they took the pastor and put him in jail. They left him a few days, and they let him out again and told him, don't you do that no more, because if you do, you're going to prison for a long time. Well, he went back, and they continued the same thing. So the police came and took him and shipped him up to Siberia. And he went to work at doing something. I think he was in a kitchen baking bread or something somewhere in Siberia in the cold. And, but they worked seven days a week. When Sabbath came around, he told his, the man that was in charge, he says, um, I won't be here tomorrow. <laughs> and his boss looked at him and says, what do you mean you won't be here tomorrow? He said, it's Sabbath. I don't work on Sabbath. He said, you better be here tomorrow because if you don't, you're in big trouble. Well, he didn't go. <laughs> the next day, he went to work like he was supposed to. And, oh, they got all over him, put him in jail, and did all kind of bad things to him, and told him, said, now, next time, you come when you're supposed to be here. So a week went by, and Sabbath rolled around. He told him, he said, I won't be here tomorrow. And I can't tell you the end of the story, because I didn't hear it. They're going to finish it today. It was a children's story. And I thought, what an example for us. This man's life was at stake. His whole family was at stake. But he was true to God. And what are we told to do? Though the heavens fall, we'll be faithful. My brothers and sisters... It is then that we need to be rooted and grounded in the truth, like Joseph was when he had to face Potiphar's wife who wanted him so bad. Like Daniel and his friends were with the lion's den and the fiery furnace. They were steadfast and unmoved because they trusted in a God that was able to do exceedingly more and abundantly than we can ever imagine or think. And he'll do the same thing for you and I. My prayer is that you'll be ready, that I'll be ready, that I will stand fast and hold on and follow him. And that your anchor will hold. And we're going to sing that song, page 534 in your hymnal. Will your anchor hold? When we're persecuted, when you lose your Bible, when you lose your home, and the threat of losing your life, will you be faithful? Will your anchor hold? Or will you cave in?